Okay, my name is Benson. Okay, I'm a freelance uh, web developer, and also now I'm a final year student at NTU. Okay, studying computer science. Okay, so today I'll be sharing a little bit about uh, Laravel 4. Okay, uh, everybody know what Laravel is, right? Is a no, yeah. no, I don't know. No. <laughs> okay, it's a PHP framework. Okay, an MVC framework. Okay, so. Uh, before I share this, just to uh, just a so-called disclaimer, just because I'm sharing on Laravel, okay, it doesn't mean that I'm putting down all the other frameworks because every framework has their own pros and cons. So the the purpose of this presentation is just to give you another option, okay, for your future projects. Okay, so uh, wait, sorry. Okay, so the, the areas that I'll be sharing is the introduction, the installation, the MVC layer, authentication, the inversion of control container, facade and service provider. But all these are just a tiny fraction of what the framework provides. Because I can't share everything, you know, for even this amount of time. So yeah. <laughs> okay, so just a brief introduction. Okay, Laravel 4 is created by this guy. Okay, Taylor Howell. Anyway. Okay, just just for uh, extra information, he's actually a .NET developer. So what happened was he took what he liked about .NET and he poured it to PHP. So he created Laravel 4. Okay, so his objective of creating Laravel, okay, firstly, is to allow developers to start working on the project fast. Okay, second, he wants it to be fun. Okay, why is it fun? What, what's the definition of fun? Later, I'll be showing you. And to promote good design patterns, uh, is what we call solid design patterns, okay, which I will not run through. Okay, the base of Laravel, okay, firstly, is composer friendly, meaning Laravel is, the dependencies of Laravel is managed using composer. So, okay, when, when you install Laravel, what you notice is it has a big list of dependencies, okay, the most obvious being the Symfony components, okay, it's actually inspired by Symfony. So, it's actually built on top of Symfony and other other popular you know packages like Swift, Mailer, and Monolog, and so on. So because uh, the author of this framework, okay, he believes that he shouldn't reinvent the wheel. So what he's going to do is he make use of all the, the excellent work out there and he build it on top. Okay, so okay, and one more thing about Laravel is in story you realize that uh, it needs PHP 5.3. Okay, why? Because Laravel makes extensive usage of a uh, new feature in 5.3 known as closure. Okay? Every every single function you see on Laravel, okay, most of them have closures. Okay, what? In case anybody doesn't know what a closure is, okay, closure is just a, a way to specify an anonymous function. So for instance in Laravel, okay, this is the standard way you define a route. Okay? where this is the URL pattern, this is the controller name, okay, and this is the action of the controller that you want to invoke when you access this URL. Okay, so um, a shortcut, okay, supposedly uh, for any action, the, the action is so simple that you find that there's no need to, you know, port the code, port the code to a controller. So what you can do is a shortcut is, you can use a closure here where it's, it's the same thing, you specify a URL pattern, but instead of specifying the controller, <coughs> you you specify a callback here. Meaning, when this URL is, is accessed, this function executes. That's all. Actually, that, that's the test about it. Okay. So another thing about Laravel is, okay, just now we say that the author wants wants it to be fun for usage for developers. Okay. Laravel is well known for the syntactic sugar. Okay, what I mean by syntactic sugar? As you can see, right, everything is so easy to understand. Okay, it looks like okay, it looks like they are static method calls. Right? Actually, they are not static method calls, which I will cover later. But the objective of creating it this way is so that you, as a developer, you will understand. It's easier for you to understand what's going on and easier to code. Okay, so the installation part is actually very straightforward. Okay, anybody doesn't know what's Composer, everybody knows, right? Okay, it's just a simple command, which is this. Okay, most of y'all who use Composer, y'all should know this command. This is a very, very common command. But the thing about Laravel is, 
okay, which I believe is not documented is you have to specify this no death and prefer distribution. Okay, why? Okay, because the the default distribution of Laravel is about 21 megabytes if I'm not mistaken. So what happens is if you don't specify this, it's going to download 100 meg worth of source code for some reason because I believe you also download the git the git files. Okay, so this is one thing to take note. Okay, so I think it's, a, the, it's because yeah. of change in uh, how Composer checks out files. Yeah, also. Yeah, yeah. previously by, the, by default it's set to no dev. Yeah. But uh, I think the new version of Composer changed it. Yeah, you correct, correct. Download the dev unless, yes, correct. You, unless you specify don't download the devs. Yeah, okay. So, uh, okay. So, MVC. Okay, MVC, model view controller, everybody knows. Okay, it's like heart and soul of any framework. Okay, so I will just briefly touch on the, the MVC. Okay, the first thing, the model, okay, there's, there are many ways you can interact with the database using Laravel, okay, you can use a query builder and a schema builder, but I will not be discussing these two today, okay, what I will be discussing is an ORM that which they offer called Eloquent, and also for the view, for the templating system, they have a Blade engine, and I will also cover the controller, okay, first thing, Eloquent, okay, Eloquent is just like any common ORM, okay, it allows active record uh, access to all your records, okay, and it's easy to use because supposedly you have a, okay, you have a table, okay, you have a table called book, okay, this is the standard way of creating, creating an eloquent ORM, you extend from the eloquent, you specify a table name, the primary key, and whether you are enabling timestamp for the for the table okay that, that's all you don't have to specify any you know columns okay because the ORM will detect them at runtime okay so okay some examples okay supposedly okay same example you have a book table okay some examples maybe you're gonna search for all the books uh, where's my mouse okay okay this will get all the books this will find find the book with the ID one and the where clause and so on. Okay, so inserting of data is also very straightforward. Okay, instantiate a new book, then set the parameters and save. Okay, it's the same. It's a very straightforward thing. So the thing about ORM is, okay, you need to support this thing called relationship because in when we talk about you know SQL databases, normally tables we specify relationship. Okay, by foreign keys. So in ORM or rather in local ORM. They make it easy such that, okay, all you need to do is write a write a function, or rather a method in the in the model class, and you specify the relationship using using an inherited method. But okay, this is one example of a one-to-many relationship. Okay, there's every I mean every kind of relationship is supported. You know, one-to-one, one-to-many, many-to-many, and in Laravel there's also a relationship called. Uh, which I don't remember. It's okay. This okay. Never mind. Later I will cover it again. So another thing about uh, Eloquent is it supports soft deletion. Okay. And okay. So what soft deletion? Because you know sometimes when we develop applications, you know, so, sometimes when you offer a. Yeah, so, okay. Sometimes when we develop applications, you provide a delete function, but sometimes you cannot, due to certain, uh, maybe certain requirements, you cannot de actually delete the data off. The, okay, for example, if you have an invoice, you know, invoice and your products, you know, you cannot delete your products, then if you delete your products, something will, be, something will happen to your invoice. Example, so Laravel, okay, by default, Laravel supports the notion of soft delete, meaning, you have this table, okay? You have this column called deleted. So when this row is flagged as deleted, it's taken as deleted, yeah. But actually it's not physically deleted, it's just a flag. Okay, so when you enable the soft delete option at eloquent, okay, how do you enable is in your model, okay, you just set the soft delete property to true. So once you do that, what's going to happen is any further queries Laravel will automatically exclude the soft deleted rows. It is automatic, okay? And 
if so, for some reason you need the deleted, the soft deleted rows to appear for some reason, okay, there are also ways to get it, okay. And of course, you can also undo the soft delete by restoring. Yeah. And uh, Aaron? yeah. Is this within the execution of the page that it's soft deleted, or is it? I'm assuming that the soft delete applies only to the execution of this page, right? No, uh, this no, stored no, in the database throughout the whole database. It's marks. Uh, it, there is a column called deleted. Okay. It, it just. Yeah. Makes it true. Do I need to? Oh, database? so it has to be supported from the DBS. Well. Yes. Yeah. It has to be supported from the from the DBS. That means I need to create that field, right? Yes. You need to. That means you need to create the column, which the column name is specified in the documentation. They have already briefed you about this. Okay. So uh, for eloquent, there's another feature called okay the query scope. Okay. What query scope does is it allows you to reuse certain parts of a query. Okay. Easily. Okay, for example, maybe, you know, I want to search the book table, you know, uh, I want to get, you know, any, any books where the rating is more than four, example. Okay, so, supposedly you need, you need this part in other parts of your application. So what you can do is, you can specify this part, okay, as a scope, okay. So once you specify it as a scope, okay, you can actually use a method here to automatically inject this this into a query and then it's as though you just executed an SQL where, where, where this where clause is inside yeah that, that's the purpose of scope of course scope is not limited to where it can be anything you can add any anything you know uh, limit you know uh, group by or anything it can it can work okay so um, and one more thing about eloquent is it supports the notion of accessors and mutators okay when when are they useful? Okay, for example, last okay last time when I have a database, okay, I have this user table. So one of the column says gender. Okay, no no point I put male or female. So normally I'll just put M and F in my database. But the problem is if you put M and F, when you try to display, it displays M and F. But I do not want that. I want to display male and female. So what the accessor the accessor can do here is. When you when you uh, declare accessor on a column, okay, in which the, the current value is passed here, okay, it will try it, you can use it to transform the out the current value into a readable output for your pages, okay. And mutator is just the opposite. is is something that that is triggered when you try to uh, set the data before it saves to the database. It's just the opposite. Okay, so for you open that's about it. So the next thing is the blade engine. Okay, this one can be a bit confusing, so please bear with me. Okay, blade engine, okay, is the stock templating engine for Laravel. Okay, what, what is so special about blade engine is that it supports template inheritance, okay, and uh, sections. Okay, so Okay, what does it mean by template inheritance and section? Okay, first, for instance, this is just a very simple example. Okay, suppose this is a layout. Okay, layout meaning this section, this, uh, this entire code will appear in all our pages. Okay, example. So maybe you know, I want to allow my sub pages to specify one title here. I want to allow my sub pages to inject their own CSS here, JavaScript here, and most importantly. Okay, I want to allow my pages to have their own custom content, so to specify one area here for them to inject into. Okay, this is the layout. Okay, so when another page wants to use the layout, what you do is very straightforward. You simply, okay, this is going to be very confusing. Okay, firstly, okay, suppose that this is any one of your sub pages. Okay, so what's going to happen is you extend the layout. Okay, which layout is this? This this is the layout file. Okay, you extend the layout. Okay, and then the first thing you see here is, okay, we allow the sub page to define a title. Okay, so we use the page title here. Okay, but this is defined by the sub page. So in the sub page, what you do is, you define a section in which the name of the section matches this. Okay, which is this page title. Yeah. Oh, okay. This is a typo. Okay, it's a typo. This, okay, what I meant is speech title. Okay, it's a typo. Okay, and you specify the value. 
the value here. Okay, and the same the same thing goes for every every other section. You know, for example, if you want to allow your sub pages to inject your own CSS or your own JavaScript, it's the same thing. You just declare a section. Okay. It, yes, I mean it doesn't have to be called JavaScript. It can it can be called anything. It's it's up to you. As long as the names you specify matches the name here. Yes, this is to define a uh, which that this this code is to be injected to this part of the layout. Yeah, that that's what it meant by template inheritance and sections. Okay, yeah, and the same the rest works the same way. And in Blink Engine, okay, we have some uh, control structures. You know, in views we always have those common common uh, those common structures like you know if else loop. These are very common structures, right? So in Blink Engine, it is supported this way. Okay, whenever you want an if statement, you simply use an add sign if, else if, else, and if. Example, and Blink Engine also has this un unless tag, okay, which is just the opposite of an if. That there's there's nothing special about it. Okay, and the rest is just you know loops and so on. Okay, and my personal favorite thing about Blade Engine, okay, this is actually just a very small because personally when I, in views, right, I hate it when I have to start typing this PHP echo whatever, then close this. Personally I hate it, okay? I just hate it. Okay, so yeah, Blade Engine allows you allows an alternate syntax where you use double braces to act as an echo in PHP. Okay, so some of you may be wondering, oh, if this, if Blink Engine supports so much features, you know, supports all these, supports all these, does it mean that you know my pages is going to render very slow? Because all these are not natively supported by PHP. Is yeah. So what's going to happen is when Laravel encounters any page that uses the Blink Engine, they will compile it into another form in in standard PHP. So subsequently when the subsequently when the same page is uh, requested, they will just take on the catch and execute without re recompiling the, the page. Okay? So yeah. So about the controller part, okay, basically there's three there's three types of controllers supported in Laravel. Okay, the first is the basic controller where you know you just have a basic control, you just have a simple controller, okay? And you just declare a function to perform an action. Okay, so for instance, you know when you have an authentic authentication controller, then you just you want to have an action called show login form. So you just return the view here. This is the simplest. And whenever you have an action here, it has to be accompanied with a routing. So so for this example, this path, okay you map to this controller and this action. They are very straightforward. Okay? But the bad thing about this approach is, okay, as you can see, one function dictates one action, which means every action you have in your controller, you need one route, one route here. Okay? So this is the first approach. The second approach is the RESTful controller, okay, in which is this way. Okay, for this approach, the difference between this and the previous one is this time round, okay, you only have one line here to map the, all the actions here to map all the actions here to the route. Okay, how it works is every action name here has to be preceded with a HTTP verb, okay, get, post, and so on. Okay, so yep, that's about it for this one. Yeah. And the next one is what they call a resource controller, which is actually also a, re a restful controller, except that it's done in a different way. Okay, first thing is okay. Laravel has a command line interface called Artisan, which I will not be in, uh, elaborating today. Okay, so what happens? You use the command line tool to generate the controller, and what will happen is it automatically includes all the actions, I'm sorry, it automatically include all the actions here and it, it automatically assumes the all the path patterns here okay and it also generates a default route name for you. Route names are usually used in Laravel to 
uh, generic URLs for your actions. That, that's the primary usage of route names. Yeah. So, yeah. actually I wanted to demo, but now it's a bit difficult. Uh, let me try. So, okay. Okay, so let me just show a very short demo of how to, you know, how to use the MVC layer. So, supposedly, hey, wait, that's my mouse. Okay, supposedly, I have two, okay, this, this is a very simple example. I have, I have a book table, you know, I have an author table. Okay, so, what I'm going to do is, uh, okay, I've created an empty project before I, uh, just to save time, okay. Sorry. Okay, so when you use uh, Composer to create a project, a default project in Laravel, okay, the directory structure looks something like this, okay, where all your dependencies are here. Okay, and yeah, your public folder which yeah, is here, and whatever any other app specific code is here. Okay, so for instance, if I'm going to start coding, okay, the first thing to do is uh, you go to the config, you need to configure database, right? So it's very straightforward. You simply, okay, for instance, I'm using my SQL, so you just set all this, okay. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the first thing. Okay, the second thing is, okay, let me just close this. Now, okay, let's define the models, which is here, okay. So, see that's what happens when you come mirror, I have to look there. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Examples. Okay, this, this is very straightforward, it's just, Okay, remember I just showed you this. Okay. Oh, um, sorry. Name. Okay. All models in Laravel, okay, you need uh, some basic fields like your table name. Okay, in this case, I'm using Okay, and the primary key of this uh, ID. Okay, and the next thing is to specify whether your ta your table supports timestamps, in which I'm not going to, sh to support. Okay, that's all. That's all for sorry. That's all for one. So I'm, so it's very simple. I just copy and paste. Where's my mouse? So okay. So this is the same thing. Looks like you didn't save. Oh, it's okay, it's okay. I just realized also. So it's just changing this. There is some space on top. Because it's hard to type this way. <laughs> Sorry. You can turn it around. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, you just sit on the table and type first. Okay, wait. So, yeah. Okay, one thing to demonstrate, right? Okay, one thing to demonstrate is... Uh, wait. Oh, it's so troublesome to find my mouse. Okay, in this example, okay, if you look at this... Oops. Okay, in this example, we have this table. Oh, sorry, it's the other table. Okay, it has a reference to another author by a form key. This, this is a very common thing in database, right? 
So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to specify a relationship here, okay, by, okay, by doing something like this, okay. Supposedly for every book that you query out later in the database, you want to be able to access the author directly. So what you do is you define a relationship, example, author, okay, you specify the relationship type, And then the the foreign the foreign key column. Yeah, that's all. Yep. Okay, so now the model is done. Okay, so the controller is even easier. Everything is very easy. Yeah. But now I'm very stressed because I can't I, I have to look at the screen. Actually you can sit here. Yeah, I can just sit here. Here, sit and look at that very easy. Let me try. Yeah, it's very stressed to look at the screen and then type on the other screen. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I think even if you don't face us, we can hear you. Yeah. Yeah, this is Okay, so okay, let's define a new controller. Maybe okay, let's book. Oh, that's so much better. Controller. Okay. Okay, so for so suppose I need to create a function where I want to list all the books. Okay, I will only be creating this function just to save time. Okay, uh, let's say show all. So it's very simple. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to trigger the view for this function. Okay, by doing this. Okay, so this is supposedly this is the, the name of the view. But at the same time I want to throw the data to the view. So what I'm gonna do is I will specify the data here in which the the view can access the books with this with this uh, variable which the value set to very simple, it's just like that. This is the it open shortcut. This will query all the books. Okay. Assuming there's no pagination involved, okay. this is just how you get all the books. Okay, that's all. Okay, so for the view part, okay, just a simple example. Okay, as you can see, my view is book.org. Okay, when you see book.org, the dot here is actually the separator. So that means you need a book directory and an all file here. Okay, if you want to use the Blade engine, okay, you have to precede your file extension with Blade. Okay, that's all. Which actually I've actually written beforehand. Okay, this, where well, this, okay, this is just a simple loop. This corresponds to this. Okay, so I will just, you know, display the title, okay, and the author. When, as you can see, this is actually a relationship here. So, once that's done, the final thing to do is you need a route to the action. Okay. Okay, now when, when you install the Arabel, okay, by default you will see this page. Okay. I don't know what this page means, but, but yeah, okay, this is the page you will see. Okay, <laughs> so let's read. Hello. Uh, Suppose I create uh, another route. Suppose slash book. Okay. Okay, when that's done and just a bit more space. Yep. Yeah. Okay, uh, okay. The, these books don't exist, okay? It's just an example. Okay, you see some familiar names here, you know? Yeah, okay. So, this is just a simple example of of how you, how quickly you can get started with uh, Laravel. Okay, okay. Let me walk over there again. So, 
So A. Okay, the rest I will just briefly go through again. Let me see. Okay. Ah, hello, man. Fedora and Mapo is a problem at the Microsoft Office. Yep. It is where I start, right? Okay. Some of the other uh, more prominent components of the framework, okay. First thing, okay, just sharing a few. Uh, the first thing is the authentication. So what happens is what, what the first thing that attracts me uh, to Laravel is when I try to use the authentication layer, okay, the the, the authentication feature of the, the framework, it's very easy to use. Okay, I managed to create my lock in, my lock out, you know in less than three minutes yes it's very easy okay so in laravel it supports two kinds of authentication http basic and your normal application level kind of authentication so for the for the second one the first one, i won't be talking about the first one okay the second one okay, okay it's very simple what you need to all you have the methods here are already written in the api Okay, these are some explanatory. I don't have to explain. Okay, this is just to try to log in. This is just to check if the user is logged in and so on. Okay, that's all. Okay, what is what's so special about the authentication layer here is, okay, by okay, uh, last time right, uh, when we talk about saving passwords, okay, of course we don't save the password as a plain text in the database. So maybe we use you know MD5 SHA, but nowadays, yeah. Unless you're LinkedIn, in which case you just save it in clear text. <laughs> Sorry? Unless you're LinkedIn, in which case you just save it in clear text. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, but nowadays, uh, MD5 and SHG1 is no, con are no longer considered secure. So, what's one of the uh, popular hashing algorithms that's where the usage is rising is, is this thing called B-Creep. Okay. Okay, in case anybody, okay, who doesn't know what BCrypt is? Uh, okay, just a very brief explanation. BCrypt is actually a, a hashing algorithm where, okay, there's an existing hashing algorithm known as Blowfish. Okay, so what BCrypt does is it takes the Blowfish algorithm, okay, in order to intentionally make the server take more time to compute the, the password hash, okay, what they do is they, they define a workload here. Okay, in Laravel, the default workload is 8. Okay, what does this 8 mean? It means the Blowfish hash will be executed 2 to the power of 8 times. Which means, if the default workload is 8, that means they will execute the hash 256 times. Okay, the purpose is to intentionally, you know, take more time to compute the hash. To, so that when somebody tries to brute force your password, it will take longer. Yeah, that, that's the motivation of uh, BCrypt. So, the default workload is 8, which you know you can change easily by just specifying the workload here. Yeah. The higher the number of rounds, the higher every the Every increase by 1 means you double the number of times, because it's 2 to the power of x. Right, so while it makes it more secure, the increase your probability of getting hit with it. No, actually side. it doesn't. Um, the From what I read online, the purpose is not really to make it more secure. It's actually intentionally making the hashing taking longer time. So that it takes longer to hack to to brute force. And right, it's still so DDoS you la. But Sorry? they can DDoS you, right? Yeah, they can. So if I send in a two gig password, that's good. <laughs> right. I've done that right. before. Right. A two gig password. <laughs> yes, a password file that's two gig. I send a post request over from one line. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they have fun hashing it. They didn't try. So yeah, that's a new one. <laughs> Mine is looking at me. Yeah, you person. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so the down, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Of course, there are ways to prevent that. Like, <laughs> just tell you what's the motivation behind you creep. You can check the link before. Check the link. <laughs> <Check it. laughs> yes. yeah. So, yeah. Okay, the next thing uh, in Laravel, okay, this is a very important concept to understand when, if you decide to take Laravel seriously, this is a very important thing to know is the IOC container. Okay? The IOC is inversion of control, okay? What this does is, if you have a class, okay? Um, supposedly, this class has a dependency on another class to work. 
So last time the standard way is in this class you just instantiate that class and you use it, right? But the thing is this approach will make it less flexible and a little bit no more uh, less usable. Okay, so now the norm is you use IOC style in which the dependency is injected into your into your class instead of instantiating from the class itself. Okay? So in Laravel, okay, there are two ways where the IOC container resolves the type. Okay? First is by a closure. The second way is by auto automatic resolution. Okay. What it means is okay, suppose you have the first case. <coughs> this is very simple. Okay. So I find I find an object okay, in which I give it this name. Okay. And whenever I access this this name, it returns an object of this type. Example. So so once you, you bind this type into the IOC container, see? So you want you want an, a new object of this type, okay? What you do is you use this syntax, okay, to access the IOC container. So it's so doing this is as good as instantiating a new object here. But some some may wonder what then why shouldn't I instantiate it directly? It's the same effect, right? But the thing is if one day if your app gets big, okay, you have 20 over places where you need you need to use this. Okay? And one day your requirements change, you decide that you need to swap the data, the data type. If you have 20 over places with the same dependency, you're gonna change it 20 over times. That's why that's why this method you centralize the change to one place. <coughs> Meaning you change you change the data type here, okay. Any any other any other section of your application that uses this, they will you be the change will be reflected automatically. That that's the purpose of IOC. Okay, and another way that the the types can resolve okay, is by automatic re resolution, in which okay, you just you know have a class as per normal. Okay, okay. The difference right here is in the previous example you have to bind the type into the IOC container here. Okay. For automatic resolution, you realize that all we do is we write a class. Okay, we didn't buy anything to IOC container. But when you try to instantiate the, the class using this syntax here, okay, first thing is not only can it instantiate this, okay, at the same time, you realize that the constructor has a dependency here. This dependency will also be injected for you automatically. Okay, how it's done actually is not it's not really magical. It's just uh, internally Laravel just uses the reflection API to 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 spot the type hinting here, and then they will try to detect, try to load the class with this, and they will try to inject it for you. That, that's all. Yeah, it's just for convenience. Okay, and okay, the last example here is okay. This is the same as this. Okay, it's exactly the same. Except that this time round, okay, you have an interface type declared as a type hinting here. Okay, obviously PHP wouldn't know which which data which concrete type you are referring to when you try to resolve it, right? Because you can't instantiate an interface. So in this case, what you do, is you have to let Laravel know, okay, which interface. I'm uh, sorry, which concrete class to inject into when this when this interface type is encountered. So, if this method has this, uh, sorry, has this signature here, okay, where it expects any concrete type, uh, object of this type, okay, you specify that you will always inject this type, okay, for this interface. So once you, once you specify this, then you can use it as per normal, like just now, you know, you just add, add make, okay, then that's all, okay. So another thing. No, another important thing to understand in Laravel is this concept called facade. Okay, just now when we talk about Laravel having this syntactic sugar, yeah, look at this. Very easy to understand. So, last time when I was learning Laravel, I had this impression, oh, this is this framework is bad, you know. So many static methods. It, it just looks like a static method, right? Okay, actually it's not a static method. Okay, it's actually a facade in 
in place. Okay, so how this facade work is, okay, it's very simple actually. You have this object, okay. You inject the object, I'm oh, sorry, you register the object into the IOC container. Okay, very simple. Next, you create a, you create a facade which reference the object. And that's all. And the only thing to watch out for is if you use namespaces for a facade, then you have to define an alias, but I won't be covering this uh, today. Okay, so if I were to give you a very simple example, let's say, okay, suppose you have, uh, let me see, okay, let's, let's define a very simple thing here. Suppose I say, something on the example okay okay so I go to my browser okay. Okay. So, okay very simple right so supposedly one day okay since it's just an example and pre a pretty weird one okay so suppose your app gets big one day and you have you need to do this all over the place example okay so it makes sense to make this a function right mm. okay for you to reuse so, so so supposedly instead of doing this okay let me just okay instead of doing echo whatever now i want to change the syntax to a facade style let's say i want to do this Okay, I want to replace it with this. Okay, how do you do it? Very simple. Okay, okay, uh, okay. For this example, I'll just put the files here. Okay, but right, it shouldn't be here, just to save time. Okay, so suppose I have uh, a class called Greeter. So what you do is you extend you extend the Laravel facade class. Uh, sorry, I need to specify the full name. Uh, what's the full name? Okay. okay. So okay, when you extend the facade from the facade class, okay, you only have to do one thing actually. You just need to override a stepping method, okay? Uh, sorry. Ah, you're okay. So, what? So, what does this function do? Okay, so, suppose, okay. What this function do is it returns the name that is used. You know to to register the object into the IOC container because before your facade works, you need an underlying object inside your IOC container, right? So, so this is supposedly this is the name that we use. Okay. So next, but this is just a facade. You need an actual class. Okay. So suppose uh, you have an actual class here, maybe. Mm, okay. Let's say actual. This can be different name than the class name. Sorry? This can be different name than the class name. The <coughs> uh, sorry, I don't get you. Uh, can you go back to the previous script? Um, greeter. Uh -huh. So the return greeter. Mm -hmm. can no, no, it, it doesn't have to be the same thing. Yes. Yes, okay, I'll be showing you yeah. what, what does this greeter mean, okay? okay. So supposedly you have an you have object which, which is the actual object doing the work. Okay, example, you know, So now, okay. Okay. So this is what we wanted, right? Okay. 
Okay, so the thing is, how do you make this syntax work? Okay. Okay. So now I just remove this. Okay, to make this work, okay, what you need to do is you need to register the object here. Okay, okay. Let me find the So what you do is you need to register the object. Okay, this is not the actually this is not the proper place to, to inject this code. Okay, but just an example. Okay, so I register something into the IOC container. Okay, supposedly just now I. Okay, you see this. Okay, this name has to match whatever you specify here. That's all. It doesn't do. This name doesn't have to match the class name, okay? So, you know, so you just create a callback to return the actual object. Uh, okay. So once you've done that, okay, then, uh, wait, where am I? Then this, then, this should work. Okay, let me try. Now oh, there's one colon missing. Yeah. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oops. Colon. You know the error screen looks nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, the error screen looks nice. Yes. It's a little double colon. A little where? Say hi. Say hi. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's why we use an ID. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that's how the first side works. Okay, so when, when you learn Laravel and you see a s static kind of syntax, okay, please don't be mistaken. They are not static methods. Okay, it's just a convenience. Just, it's just for convenience. It's actually a first side. Okay, so come back to here. Okay. okay, the last thing to share today is uh, this function called service provider. Because in any framework, okay, the thing about frameworks, you want to reuse components as much as you can. But, so, uh, so Laravel's way of supporting uh, component reuse is by using this uh, idea called service provider. Okay, what does it do? Okay, okay, like I said, it allows you to add reusable components to your application. Okay, it can be anything, okay? It can be maybe a custom database driver maybe an alternate way to hash your password, anything. Okay, it can be anything. Okay, so it's actually it's actually very straightforward here. Okay, so where's my mouse again? Okay. So if I want to plug a function into the into my framework, okay, a, a new component of my framework, okay, very straightforward. You create a you create a service provider, okay, assuming that uh, you have finished written, re writing your library. Okay, you wanted to expose this library to your application. So what you do is you write a service provider here. Okay, and what you do is you bind, you bind your library, your main class, okay, into the IOC container. It's the IOC container again. Okay, then once you have done that, you register the service provider to the IOC container. So what happens is when you register the service provider, okay, what the IOC container do is it instantiates your service provider and just trigger this method. And this will bind this object to the IOC container. So once you've done that, you can you can access your, your new library the exact same way. Okay, in this example is just uh, an example of MongoDB, okay, which Laravel doesn't support out, out of the box. Okay, just imagine you want to add a function. Okay, so this is how you add the function. Yeah. So, okay, having said that, right, okay, what I shared today, right, is actually, I will say is, yeah. Yeah, so your question. Will it be possible to have a server, service provider acting as a facade? Are they the previous one that you used to? Uh, so can we think? Yeah, uh, on the previous slides, you talked about the ingredients, mm -hmm. like static. So can a service provider be like greetings? You, you use a service provider as with a facade. Yes. 
can you use a service provider as a facade? So for example, this MongoDB manager, can I have a facade for this MongoDB manager? You can. Okay. Yeah, you can, you can. Okay. Yeah, it's actually done exactly the same way. Yeah, you just de declare a facade class. Okay. So, okay, to answer a question, what you can do is, okay, you notice this is the name that we use to bind the object to the container. So, if you want to access the facade, all you have to do is you create a facade class in which, remember you got to overwrite one of the functions, okay, you just return the same, the exact same signature here, as in the same name, then you, the facade will work, okay? Yeah, so, okay, like what, what I said, right, whatever I shared today, right, is actually very, I would say I'm just scratching the surface, okay? Because, okay, if you notice, right, okay, let me show you what Laravel actually provides. Okay, if you go to Laravel page, right, the documentation, right, you realize that there's actually a lot of stuff here. Okay, so what I shared today, right, is just the, the most basic concept of Laravel that you have to understand if you want to take it seriously, okay, because most of the functions, right, you, it requires understanding of the IOC container, which is what I, I brief you all about the IOC container. So, uh, if you want to learn Laravel, okay, to me, first thing, okay, when you learn any framework, your doc the documentation is your best friend, obviously it's your best friend. Okay, because what I realize is it's quite comprehensive. Okay, secondly is you need this API here, okay, which you access it from here, here. Okay. Why is this API important? Because what I realized from my past few months of developing with Laravel is there are actually a lot of hidden functions that's not documented here. So I only figure it out when I, when I look at the API. Yeah. So, uh, so that's about it for today. So any questions? Have you used the migration? Okay, Laravel supports migration, but actually I haven't I haven't used it before. Yeah. That's one of the most uh, um, complex thing about managing an application is schema schema changes. Yes. So uh, So it's yeah. actually supported in Laravel, yes. So what does it do? It allows you to specify a schema changes. Uh, actually you specify the schema changes through PHP uh -huh. and you have also a rollback function. That if, if you want to roll back for any reason, that roll back is exactly the previous way. So it's actually describing your DB migration through PHP. So there are functions that um, you can create new structure on the tables and or adjustments, and you can roll back at the time. And this is uh, accessed through command line through artisan client. Yeah. I noticed you use you have it's explicit, you explicitly declare the table name and yep. primary primary key and all that. Yes. Is it? Doesn't doesn't Laravel kind of like automa automatically? Okay, it does the... make some assumptions about your data. Your data, for instance, okay. When I show you this just now, right? Okay, let me go back. Okay, supposedly this. Okay. I specify the primary key uh, explicitly because, okay, if I'm not mistaken, okay, by default, if you don't specify this, they will think that your column is called ID. Yeah, so this, ju this just allows you to override the convention. Yeah. And if you don't specify this, problem, what happens is they will just assume that the, the table is the same as your class name, but lowercase. It doesn't yeah. use a plural form. Sorry? It doesn't use the plural form, does it? Plural form. Which it doesn't assume the uh, table name. Uh, yeah, this is actually, something that I haven't looked into because okay. normally I would just overwrite the convention yeah, like that. Because most uh, active record uh, style yeah. frameworks uses that kind of thing. Yeah, because, okay, this is something that I'm not very sure because normally I would just overwrite anyway. Yeah. Uh, actually, for I think for ADODB framework, it goes, when it goes and that's the introspection of the columns, right? It also figures out what is the primary key, and it fits itself in automatically. So uh, I yes. don't know whether it does it. Uh, but apparently, it doesn't seem to detect so it the primary key. It just It just assumes its ID column. Right? Yes, it just assumes that the default name is ID. Yeah. 
So if you use an alternative name, you have to override it here. That's all. So, one last question. Why is the memory <coughs> footprint for this framework? Uh, yeah. Because I realized that it has a lot of dependencies. So will you say the idea of a simple shared server hosting for another round, what is the response time for another round just for the framework itself? Or a simple request? Oh okay, there was once uh, where uh, Okay, there was once where I tried to measure how much time it takes to render a page. Okay. Okay, if I remember correctly, wait, let me think. It's about maybe 30 to 40 ms. I'm check. Around that, around that. What about memory? Memory? Like for, let's say I run a long running process using memory. Oh, actually this idea is really very fine. Okay. Yeah. Because I know for is less than 10 megabytes, which is like very good for PHP. Yeah. So, yes. The response time was on shared hosting or was it on uh, shared hosting? But, but then I test it on a local server, so probably that's why it's faster. Maybe, I don't know. Yeah. So, no questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Srivas, for the very informative uh, talks about uh, uh, Fing and uh, uh, Hudson and, uh, and also from uh, for Laravel. Uh, yeah, so we hope to continue doing this on a monthly basis. Sorry, we have a little bit of hiatus over the last few months. I apologize, uh, but uh, we'll hope to keep this going again on a monthly basis. Uh, do uh, post some I post ideas about topics you want to listen or hear about uh, in the PHP for, uh, our PHP user group, uh, and we we'll be welcome. We we'll welcome any of any of uh, feedback or how we can make this better. Or do you think the timing is okay? Is it too early? Is it too late? Uh, just a, a show of hands. Are we okay with the timing? We keep yeah. it this timing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, best as I can. Best effort. I'll try to get food. <laughs> they were very lucky to get food, so thank you uh, from Microsoft uh, for, for the great food. There's still pizza out there, so you know, can go help yourself to, uh, to if you're still hungry. Uh, and uh, yeah, anything, just uh, drop us, drop me a message on Facebook uh, or post a message on the Facebook uh, group. Uh, if you have any questions or anything, any, any topics you really want to hear about, let us know. Uh, and you, you have my phone number, you have my email probably. Yeah, so uh, drop me a mail uh, and uh, don't spam me too much. Um, yeah, uh, the video will be online, I hope, soon. Um, then we'll probably can share this with your friends. Go on YouTube. Uh, somewhere, la, somewhere it's online. La. I don't know where. Uh, get Tech 65 to put up for you because they have a very high limit on YouTube videos. We'll see how. All right. Thank you, guys. Uh, I'll see you guys next month, hopefully. Okay, t-shirt, you have to experiment here. Oh.